Hello, everybody. This is Michael Filesage checking in here again, and thank you for joining in today. So if you guys remember, yesterday I made a video about Kintan problems. Well, after I made that video, I checked on my um, Floridia Grass Lover tubs, and I noticed a small spot that looked very trichy. And so the video that you're seeing overlaid right now, that's my view yesterday. And now what you're seeing right now is my view today. So what I did yesterday was I tried to take like little pieces uh, just because I, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to harvest it today. So I don't want it to spread too much. So I took it off with my hand and then I just threw it away, uh, which obviously is not a, like if you're actually trying to keep your tub going when it's got trike, don't even bother. Trike is like a superpower. Right? It is a fungus, but it is, it is an antifungal fungus. It is a very powerful fungus. And also you don't want to be touching it and stuff anyways like I was doing um, because you're just going to be spreading the mycelium and the spores because with trike, it's mostly the mycelium that propagates itself rather than the spores, although the spores are also there, right? Uh, so basically it's just incredibly powerful. So what I did here, um, so this guy's growing on a truffle right now. Oh, by the way, this is the grass lover uh, shoe box, as I said. And this guy only fruited like six or seven fruits in the entirety of its lifetime, which was which is a month and a half. So um, yeah, six fruits, they were very healthy. They were healthy fruits, but it just didn't want to fruit anymore, right? It didn't want to fruit much. It just kept producing truffles and truffles and truffles. So that's what's going on here, tons of sclerotia. And I see this is a Christmas gift from the gods because, uh, well, now we can have some truffles with our Christmas uh, turkey today. So I'm very, very excited to have some truffles and serve it up for my family. Uh, so anyways, what I'm gonna do here is I have a wet paper towel because I just, because this thing has started turning green. It started sporulating. So now I'm just going to put this wet paper towel on there and just basically scrape it off to the best of my abilities. And why it's wet? Because I want, I don't want it to, I don't want the spores to be flying around everywhere. If it's wet, then it'll stick more to the paper towel, at least in theory. So I'm just gonna, yeah, sort of go like this. All right, cleaning it off, taking it off now here. And uh, so let us let me give you guys a good look about how it's looking. As you can see, there's some cracks in the substrate. That's usually, you know, due to truffle formation. There's one over there. And then on the bottom, there's a huge ton of truffles, but I can't really show you right now. So right here, I have two plates. The idea is one of them, I'm just gonna scrape off bits and pieces of the, of the substrate here. And then on the other one, I'm gonna put the truffles and then I might go into an even more um, vigorous cleaning process once I've got it all here. So anyways, let's do this. I've been really looking forward to this, guys. Really looking forward to this. Oh, by the way, this has been going for a month and a half, as I said. And as you can see, the casing layer is what contaminated. And that's normal, that's on point. It wasn't the spawn, but it was the casing layer because casing layers are slightly nutritious. It's nutritious for molds. That's why it's slightly nutritious, but it's enough for molds. So that's why you got to pasteurize. Uh, for example, in this case, I use Jiffy Mix. You need to pasteurize it, which is a common uh, casing layer material. Yeah, so this is right on schedule. It's not like premature contamination. You know, casing layers will eventually contaminate is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, and one month and a half is a good run. So as far as casing layers go. So anyways, I'm going to go dig in here and really really looking forward to this i've been waiting for this day for a long long time guys oh yeah oh look at that right there you can start to see some trouble there i think i got one here as well this is like a mini one cool oh yeah this is if you guys remember have uh if you guys have watched um my earlier truffle videos then i think you will remember i don't know if that's a truffle or a green it's kind of squishy. So that's going into the refuse pile. Uh, if you guys remember my early truffle videos, um, I was doing it with BRF cakes. So my earlier videos, I was using BRF cakes for the truffle. You know what, this really isn't gonna cut it for the substrate. Um, and uh, with those, they were a real pain to basically clean off the vermiculite and stuff. So with this, it's just core. Thank goodness for that. Again, you don't want to be using poo for this if you want to be harvesting truffles. Oh, wow. Here we are.
So basically, why would you want to spawn to bulk if all you want are truffles? Well, as I said in my uh, truffle, in numerous truffle videos now, spawning to bulk is basically how you get more truffles. There's, there's a, they'll basically grow bigger than in vitro. So that's the whole idea. And you will see, I am sure, in this video, the truffles are nicely sized. Remember, this is from one quart jar. That's a nice little truffle there. Oh, this is also a truffle. Look at that, mini truffle. So basically, just I'm just gonna go digging here, guys. There are a lot, a lot of truffles like this thing, little guy. You know what? I might need to change the video quality to 1080p so I could see. I could basically have some space in here. All right, so I'm just gonna be, uh, I'm just gonna keep doing it, and I don't have much to say. So if something comes up, then I'll start talking about it. Let's get harvesting. Ho 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 ho. Okay, it's not as big as I thought. <laughs> but this is a nice one. So yeah, with truffles, um, I don't really recommend using mushy grains or mushy substrates uh, like oats because they can be obtained to get off of the truffles. Although they will certainly work no problem, that's not the issue, it's just harvesting ease. Millet splits people in half. You know, some people like millet because it's harder, um, but other people don't like millet because there's so many. So I find uh, rye to be a good balance of the good qualities of, you know, both hardness and size. There we go. In terms of spawn recipes, um, the original sort of recipe or the popular kind of uh, way to do this for years has been to basically soak grains in coffee water. The idea being that the extra nitrogen will help truffle formation. But you know, I don't know how much evidence there really is for it. I think it should be assessed to be certain. Recently, I've stopped doing it just because I didn't really see much of a difference. I don't know, but the genetics are all different as well. So there's too many factors for me to really say like this is worth doing it because recently I've been doing flash prep and yeah, and uh, that is a lot easier than soaking for you know a long time. But uh, I, I'm thinking you know, okay, so flash prep, right? So why do we like soak and boil before? Well, the idea was that you know grains have lots of endospores which they do, but the idea was that um, basically by soaking it, then you sort of activate those endospores. You know, they, they sort of come out of hibernation and they think that this is a nice environment, nice moist environment to uh, basically propagate. And, and then, you know, basically at that point, once they come out of their shell, so to speak, then we burn them in the pressure cooker. <laughs> so that was the idea so that we kill them, right? Because they have to be activated because they're super strong um, to kill. That was the idea. And again, this idea may still be true. I don't know, but uh, that's why we used to soak. Um, but now, like even rye grains, you know, are basically being flash prepped, and which is what I've been doing. And, you know, it's not like I'm getting any overt contamination, but I think with flash prep, it might be beneficial to actually go up to 15 PSI or to basically um, basically cook them longer. Because now that I think about it, the slow colonization of grains also coincides with me starting flash prep. Um, and again, it's not like they're like they look bacterial or anything like that, but... I think that's also a certain factor that I need to consider here. So I will be getting a 15 PSI pressure cooker here soon. Thanks again in part due to Pacer. Thank you so much, Pacer. You are certainly contributing to the cause <laughs> and I will make great use of it and you'll you'll see it in the videos and everything. So I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be doing that as well. So yeah, lots of stuff guys.
Now, since making this video, my thoughts on the slow colonization of grains has shifted from improper sterilization, because if that was the case, then I would be having contams all over the place in the grains, which I'm not. I, I, I've come to believe that it's mostly because the flash prep is just not sufficient at hydrating the grains enough so the mycelium sort of dries out. But the reason I, I come to this conclusion is because on the live stream that I did a couple days ago, I think like two people said basically they have the same issues. Uh, and they basically corroborated what I was saying that they're having like really, really slow colonization from flash prep. So that's basically why I'm currently soaking and boiling. I've restarted doing that again. And you know, I never had any problems doing, doing it that way. I had awesome colonization, full colonization of spawn in two weeks. So I'm looking forward to go back to that. So hopefully that's the cause. I'm gonna be inoculating a bunch today. So, all right, back to the video guys. So I hope you guys are having a nice holiday season. It's uh, raining quite a bit here, over here on the west coast. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, the snow here is uh, different, you know. Uh, it doesn't snow much, at least traditionally, but when it does, at least where I'm at, it's, uh, you know, it's like <laughs> Armageddon. And, you know, people think that it's because, oh, people here aren't used to snow, so that's why, you know, like driving and stuff, it's insane. It's not, you know, I've lived in many places and uh, the snow here is different. It's basically really moist. It's like a mixture. It's not like dry, right? It's, it's uh, basically there's lots of black ice because it'll snow and then it'll have freezing rain and then it'll snow again. So now you got like a layer of black ice and that's what you're dealing with. Rather, it's not so much the snow, it's the black ice. That's the problem here in the Pacific Northwest in Canada, so. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty gnarly out there. And lots of little truffles. What's this? Oh, yeah, that's a truffle as well. Tons of them. And I'm not even getting to the big guys yet. This will take hours, guys. This will literally, oops. This will literally take hours. These are a lot easier to clean than the cakes, the BRF cake truffles that I had. But those were also a lot easier to fruit, so. So maybe next time I'm thinking about doing a truffle only tub where I don't even bother to fruit, AKA put a casing layer. So that way then it wouldn't contam. And what I can do is I could harvest the truffles once and then I'll shake up the grains again and leave it and let it recolonize and let it make more truffles. Uh, just as a fun little experiment to show you guys what you can do. Let me know if you guys would be interested in that. Very, very easy to clean off. Very easy to clean off with just these rye grains and core. I mean, this would be an awesome, you know, kind of like stealth grow just in a tub. No fruits, just truffles slowly. You know, you could just say it's their potatoes. <laughs> Anyways, I'm definitely gonna run out of space on my, on my phone, so uh, I'm just gonna film it when I get like a big one or something. Okay guys, still lots of work to do, but now I've got a good little system to get through the grains a little more efficiently. So what I did is I put this little guy here and I'm gonna take a bunch of grains, put them in here and then sift through them like this and then find like truffles like this. And then I'm just gonna, you know, clean it up. Once it's clean, then, and I get all the truffles in here, then I'm gonna dump it in here. So I'm just gonna keep doing it that way. So guys, I, ha I realized that uh, I haven't really talked in too in depth in a video, at least as far as I can remember, about why anybody would wanna go for um, truffles rather than, you know, like core lover fruits, basically, right? Because they are different species. These are grass lovers. Those are core lovers. You know, the common guys that everybody likes to grow. And uh, well, so I thought I would uh, talk a little bit on that. I've talked about it on my live streams, but I think I'll talk about it here. And you know, there's multiple reasons why somebody would wanna go for sclerotia rather than core lover fruits. Like for example, like in this hobby, right? Um, you know, fungi is a, is a kingdom that really splits people in half. You either like love it or you hate it. You hate the taste or you love the taste. You know, some people f are think that they're all poisonous and they're all creepy and they could all kill you, so don't even touch them. Whereas others know, you know, which ones are tasty. You know, they love all the different flavors between the species. 
And um, I'm assuming that a lot of you guys fit into the second camp rather than the, you know, uh, well, we're mycophiles. This place is called mycophilia, right? It's a, it's the love of mushrooms um, rather than mycophobia. So mycophobia prevails a lot, you know, especially in the West. Um, but that's changing now. So that's really good. Um, but anyways, I'm getting off point here. Basically, so, you know, if you have friends over and stuff, some people just really, really just don't understand mushrooms. They have like a real averse reaction to just the thought of eating, you know, fungi. They hate the taste. They hate like button mushrooms. They, had, they hate all sorts of mushrooms, right? You just hate it. So this is good. You know, if you have like those kinds of people as your friends and, you know, you don't want to creep them out when they come to your place, uh, then having something inconspicuous like this will, you know, won't give them any, won't trigger them, right? Won't trigger them at all. So, you know, it's a good stealth way to do, to grow it as well. But also, um, the taste is completely different with these guys compared to core lovers, right? Now you could fruit these and that's the best taste in my opinion. But if you can, even then, this is a completely different taste, you know, umami experience to the core lovers. So this is why you know, it's good to have different flavors of fungi. You know, if you go to the supermarket, all you see in most supermarkets is like button mushrooms, you know, maybe a few other species like oysters, but that's about it. And, you know, there's so many different species out there, all different flavor experiences. So I think it's, uh, it's you know, you're limiting yourself if you're just having one taste experience all the time, because there's all sorts of different taste experiences that are worth experiencing. So. Anyways, that's why I think that, you know, it's worthwhile to go to the, for these guys. Two main reasons, as I said, I'll recap, you know, stealth and also taste, you know, taste different, uh, very unique tastes. So yeah, guys, that's basically it. So I'll be back again. Look at how long this is taking, guys. This is going to take forever. <laughs> this is going to take hours. It's going to take my whole Christmas morning. Here we are so far. Yeah, here we are. So we got some taters here. So we're just going to keep going, guys. BRB. Still trudging along here. Uh, we're getting more and more here, but we're still only this much. So that means that's a good thing because that means there's loads of truffles in here, right? But at the same time, it's going to take a long time. So uh, bear with me here. But uh, yeah, I just remembered an interesting thing. You know, I was talking about the taste of the different species and such and how it's worthwhile tasting different ones. Well, if you guys, uh, I don't know if you guys know, uh, if you guys have been in this hobby for any period of time, then you probably know who Roger Rabbit is. If you don't, you know, that man's a legend. He is like, he's like the OG, you know, like top TC. Um, and he's uh, basically, um, he's he's the mo man I think that's most really that we could attribute to the rise of home mycology or at least the, the spread of home mycology. You know, he had his... Uh, DVDs and those videos have been paramount, you know, before YouTube uh, came, you know, that's where a lot of people learn from. So, you know, he talked about all sorts of processes, the man's, you know, the man's contributed so much to this hobby and uh, basically uh, his favorite. So, you know, he could grow all sorts of different species. He's had, you know, decades of experience growing and his personal favorite species in terms of taste is the Mexicana A uh, truffles, sclerotia producers, right? So his favorite is actually not even the fruits, but the stones themselves. Now, um, you know, the stones really split people into two camps. Those who enjoy the fruits from the grass lover species or those who enjoy the stones more. Generally, I find it's more the fruits that people like. If they can grow fruits, then they prefer the fruits. But uh, the stone and the fruits are definitely similar, but quite different taste experiences yeah so roger rabbit for all the stuff that he could grow his favorite was the mexicana a truffles or is the mexicana a truffles so uh, which is very interesting and the interesting thing about uh the interesting thing about the mexico a truffles is that it is most likely not a mexico grass lover but it is actually a florida grass lover just based on the size of the truffles because the uh, Mexico grass lovers don't produce big truffles, but the Florida grass lovers do. So just based on that, because the Mexico A's are known for ma mainly just producing truffles rather than any fruits. So, and they grow some big ones. So that's why, um, according to Alan Rockefeller, he believes that basically the Mexico A truffles are actually 
most likely the Florida grass lovers. So here we are now so far, getting a lot of uh, refuse. And sometimes I'm going through here and trying to see if I could find some little bits and pieces. And I just about every time I do find little truffles, but I just want to give you guys an idea of how many truffles there actually are. Here's one there, here's one there. You know, these are just like the basic big ones, right? But there's tons more if you look closely. You could see a bunch of truffles there, right? You know, and as I said, there's also a bunch of little ones around too. So yeah, this is a lot of uh, fun. You know, it's like a meditative activity. Look at that, there's one here right as well. Look at that. This is a lot of fun. It's like digging potatoes. So uh, it's a nice little meditative activity. I'm just listening to some music and uh, just chilling guys. All right guys, I'll be back. Hey everybody, so we are still going. I've been doing this for over two hours now, maybe two hours, 15 minutes, still got a long ways to go, but we're getting more and more truffles here. And I wanted to show you guys, I told you guys these guys, like truffles produce a ton of metabolites, like directly from the truffle. And that's normal. You know, with core lovers, it's no good to have so much metabolites, but with truffles, they're normal. And I wanted to show you guys, I found an example of one. And the, the reason I'm showing you this because, is because it's so thick. It's like jello. It's not, it's so viscous. It's not like water. See that? That's pretty cool. Let me see. Like, I can't, like, it'll take a lot to squish this thing. It literally feels like, like gelatin or something like that. So anyways, that's all. I will get back to it now. Okay, guys, so look at this. This is another, this is a huge metabolite that I found as I was going through this batch. And look at this, guys. It is like literally jello. It's literally just jello. Now, I wonder what kind of, you know, what kind, like if anybody can run analysis on this, I wonder what kind of compounds are in here. Very, very curious. Very, very curious. It's trying to squish it. There we go, I squished it. Now it's like that, but it's still pretty viscous here. It doesn't smell like anything strange or anything. It just smells like the uh, fungus. So, yep, just wanted to show you guys this. So, you know, back to the metabolites, I've always wondered why exactly uh, sclerotia produced so much metabolites, right? And I think, you know, I was thinking about it as I'm cleaning this up and you know, this is just a uh, speculation, but I think that maybe it's because, you know, usually fungi need a lot of moisture, right? <clears throat> so like metabolites, uh, basically sclerotia are made for, you know, catastrophes, you know, basically not ideal conditions to fruit mushrooms in. So basically what I, what I thought was, well, okay, so there's less water. So it's basically a little more prone to contamination. The fungus is not in its healthiest state, but to be healthy in such situations, uh, maybe it produces metabolites because we know that metabolites are have some sort of antibiotic activity. You know, if it's fighting contams, for example, then usually metabolites come. So maybe th they naturally produce metabolites as a workaround around, you know, not having ideal conditions, uh, perhaps moisture to fight off the contaminants. So maybe it just releases those metabolites as a safety measure. I don't know. Anyways, I'm going to get back to it. Well, guys, I didn't really film any more after that because, well, there wasn't much to film and show you that I haven't shown you already in this video. So anyways, on your screen, you should see a bunch of truffles. And this is basically the harvest. And it came up to 273 grams, uh, which is an amazing yield for one microquart of spawn in a little less than a month and a half in a shoebox with some core. So that is basically the equivalent to over 550 grams. Or, or a little less than 550 grams, I think, of um, core lovers, fresh. So that's basically like two decent flushes of core lovers on, in a shoebox, like two decent first flushes. So very good yield, very minimal effort. I'm going to be making a video in the future of me harvesting a, um, a jar, an in vitro grow of truffles of the same plate of the shoebox one that was inoculated at the same time as a shoebox one. The only difference is I didn't spawn this to a shoebox. To show you guys the difference in yield between spawning it to bulk and just keeping it in the jar or the bag, in vitro basically. Anyways guys, thanks for watching. Happy holidays. 
almost new year, guys. Have a good one. Michael File Sage, checking out.